Okay, so I definitely have more slides than I can give in 20, 25 minutes, but uh, when I get near that point, I'll sort of summarize. Uh, actually, uh, uh, th this is uh, really my talk, uh, from ovary tissue to sperm and eggs from skin, because what you'll find out is they really are related. And I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, that making eggs, uh, as we do pretty successfully in mice, is uh, from skin cells, has a problem because they're not primordial follicles, they're not locked, and they just keep on developing in meiosis and then they're gone right away. Primordial follicles function is to hold on to that egg and gradually release another egg uh, or a thousand eggs every month so that the woman actually has a reproductive lifespan and she's not sterile at the time of birth. Well, also, for the goal of making uh, women fertile or men uh, from skin cells, what we have to do is convert those in vitro generated oocytes uh, into primordial follicles and into ovaries in order to really seriously have a good result. So you'll find out that this is all related in Hayashi's lab and in my, whoops, yeah. I actually lab in my clinic, we're finding this. I'll review just a couple of things. So primordial follicles are all located in the cortex, you know that. And the cortex is the toughest membrane in the whole body. It's equivalent to the tunica albigenia in the male and has been measured by anatomists, and there is no connective tissue, including Achilles tendons, that is tough as the ovarian cortex. And that's very important for primordial follicle locking, for oocyte locking. And uh, of course, you know that we can just take the outer millimeter or millimeter and a half of the cortex, and that's where all the primordial follicles are located. And usually we throw away what's in, bet what's, what's in between the developing follicles because they're a tiny fraction of the oocytes. Now, Klaus actually has some data now that shows we shouldn't be throwing those away, but that's not my field. I'm just gonna talk about what happens to the uh, cortex. And that's what that same histology looks like uh, just uh, surgically and microsurgically. And uh, Turner syndrome is an interesting example, the extreme example. These little girls normally will have, usually will have some X, double X chromosome somewhere or they wouldn't be alive, they wouldn't be viable really. And uh, what happens usually, at least in the Turner's mosaics, is they're born with a tiny number of eggs and so those eggs are all gone by the time they're teenagers. But uh, but they're normal eggs, and if you can freeze the ovary tissue uh, before they reach that stage, then you can preserve their fertility. And, and there are eggs. You see there are follicles like this with uh, good normal oocytes in these Turner's girls, and so freezing the ovary tissue is a way to preserve the fertility and then transplant that tissue back or even mature those primordial follicles. But uh, this is uh, just a, a, a video of our general technique for uh, transplanting ovary tissue. We quilt it together and then we put it right on the uh, uh, re re resected ovarian uh, medulla in a way that the fallopian tube can actually reach the ovulated egg when it's ovulated because uh, our pregnancies are uh, almost all spontaneous and not by IVF. And this is just what gave us the clue to pressure being so important, both for uh, uh, making uh, oocytes from skin cells and also for uh, making uh, oocytes into primordial follicles. Uh, as the FSH, the red line, drops towards normal about four months post-transplant, uh, the blue line, which is AMH, goes up to extremely high levels and then goes down again four to eight months later. And so there is an over-recruitment of primordial follicles for some reason, some strange reason, uh, when we transplant ovary tissue. So what is it that locks and unlocks this primordial follicle? We postulated was tissue pressure. And now the evidence coming from everywhere is overwhelming, and including from Hayashi's lab, that pressure is really the mechanism that controls not only uh, meiotic arrest uh, in, the, uh, in the fetus, but also the uh, recruitment in adults of follicles. And this is from uh, Hayashi's work showing that elimination of the extracellular cortex or matrix induces nuclear export of FOX3. The intranuclear location of FOX3 is what locks the oocyte in the primordial follicle. And pressure, you can increase the pressure uh, in the incubator where you have in vitro generated uh, oocytes from skin and all of a sudden they stop developing. 
And this is an example of the incubator setup to demonstrate that one way of creating primordial follicles from in vitro generated oocytes that are otherwise are gonna continue through meiosis is to simply increase the pressure in the incubator. And external compression induces nuclear localization of FOX3, and when it's, uh, FOX3 goes intranuclear, then the oocyte uh, is arrested. And uh, the follicles, as you heard from Dr. LaRonda's beautiful talk, they develop toward the softer ovarian medulla. Just another example that uh, pressure and pressure gradients regulate the uh, recruitment of follicles. And so what controls the recruitment of follicles in adults from the resting phase? It's the gradual release from the fibrous cortex, just like in the fetus. And if you just look at it microsurgically, it's not a big deal. You can see the most dense stroma is externally, and as you go towards the medulla, uh, even though it's still cortex, it becomes less dense. So anti-malarian hormone declines during pregnancy in the mid and the third trimester, but increases to pre-pregnancy levels following delivery, and that was shown in 2017. And Terramoto has shown, as a matter of fact, with a huge population of patients, that during the time that the patient, the woman, is pregnant, the normal uh, uh, reduction of AMH that you would normally expect stops. And so that if a woman, is, say, has 15 pregnancies and some of the grand mal tips that we uh, see in certain populations, then she will have her ovarian longevity increased. So suppression of primordial follicle recruitment occurs during pregnancy, and pregnancy preserves ovarian reserve and ovarian longevity because of increased abdominal pressure. So how does pressure control primordial follicle recruitment? And again, this relates to my main topic about ovarian longevity and making eggs from skin cells and the plasticity of the stem cells. So this is from uh, Hayashi's direct lab. We, we collaborate, Hayashi and Amanda Clark and me and Kyle Orwig are collaborating on this whole project. So uh, in the uh, cortex, in the peripheral cortex, uh, the nuclei are rotating, I'll show you that in a minute. And in the recruited oocytes, closer to the medulla, the nuclei are static. So you see the rotation of the dormant follicles, that is the primordial follicles that are arrested, and the recruited follicles uh, are the nuclei are static. I'll show that again to you. Uh, the, the, uh, you see the, the, the cortex follicles that are primordial follicles are rotating, and internally the nuclear, uh, nucleus is not rotating. So now what about generating germ cells from skin cells in the mouse and in the human? Because we certainly understand how to do this in the mouse. Low efficiency, but that can be increased. But uh, we have started a project now in the human with the collaboration I just mentioned. So first we'll review in the mouse. So it all begins in the epiblast. Uh, that's where we have a germ cell or PGC uh, specification of the very, very early embryo. And, oh, by the way, you're, you're taking pictures, but uh, if you saw my email, you sent, I'll send you all these slides if you want. There's no, I don't have any special priority thing on it. And uh, it's uh, silver at infertile.com. If you want, I can, I can send you any slides you want. So this is the origin of the germ cell lineage, which expresses, it actually expresses pluripotent genes. But it, it's very, very, very tricky because if these expression of pluripotent genes was functional, then when it goes into the ovary or into the testes, you would have a tumor. So it's expressing the genes, but it's not a functional expression. And when transferred into the testes or ovary, PGCs give rise to functional sperm or oocytes. And if you didn't have, if, if this were functional uh, pluripotent expression, then you, you'd, be, you'd have a tumor. So a PGC is a very important cell. You don't want to be injecting uh, stem cells into ovary or testes or you'll get a tumor. And this is just a view of what you all know, the migration of these uh, uh, specified germ cells or germ cell specification occurring in the epiblast and moving up towards the dorsal ridge. And it's not until uh, it enters the gonad, male or female, that this PGC turns into a germ cell. So this is just a fun picture, uh, it's Kayashi and me. <laughs> We've been working closely together on this project. And uh, this is, uh, I always have my birthday every December in uh, Kyushu in Hayashi's lab and we have a big birthday celebration. 
So this is the paper published by Hikabi in 2016, and uh, this was the actual paper that showed it wasn't just with ES cells that you're able to produce uh, oocytes that are functional and make mice, but in iPS cells as well. And that was, that was a phenomenal work uh, to show that even with iPS cells, not quite as efficient as these ES cells, but you can generate from the skin of a mouse, you can generate oocytes that are functional, result in babies, and those babies grow up to be fertile and have more babies. So this is Ori Hakabi, who is uh, one of the really fantastically skilled experimentalists in Hayashi's lab. So the outline is very simple. Uh, ovary tissue can't be cultured very well to an oocyte as skin cells because primordial follicles are locked by intranuclear FOX3 related to tissue pressure, as I've already mentioned. So then you make skin cells to iPS cells, and that takes a while. That takes about three to four weeks. And iPS cells to epiblast cells in two days, you're just recreating what happens normally in the embryo. Then the epiblast-like cells become PGC-like cells in six days. And then you incubate the PGC-like cells with, not with granulosa cells, with fetal granulosa cells. If it were adult granulosa cells, nothing would happen. And that really recapitulates what happens normally in the fetus. And then that's about three weeks. Finally, you culture those oocytes in FSH for about 11 days after dissociation, HCG for one day, and, um, and then you have a competent oocyte. So, firstly, making the iPS cells from skin or fibroblasts, these stem cells must be differentiated in culture into PGC-like cells. In other words, we're not de-differentiating, uh, we're differentiating the stem cells. And this is fairly easy to do. And these iPS cells can be made readily by incubating somatic cells like skin with just four known genes, which can be readily purchased, which is wild. Uh, and then you can just use three genes, uh, but you got much better iPS cells if you stick with the original four that Yamanaka described. So it's best not to cut corners on making iPS cells. Uh, then you can maintain those iPS cells in just three genes, LIF, FGF1, and GSK2Bi. And then next, you incubate those iPS cells in three genes, again, commercially available to make epiblast-like cells. And the primordial germ cells arise, are specified from a corner of the epiblast just at the beginning of gastrulation, so you need epiblast-like cells in order to make the PGCs. And the three genes required to make epiblast cells are active in A, B, F, G, F, on, and KSR. Now, I don't really memorize all that, but you can purchase these commercially, and, and then you just use them after commercial purchase. It's, it's not really complex uh, genetic microbiology. Uh, then these cells are incubated with five genes, uh, and uh, from that, from epiblast, you get PGCs, and these, again, are commercially available genes. So with this relatively simple in vitro culture, you now have primordial germ cells, which can be made into functional oocytes or sperm, but here are the provisos. Uh, they can, PGC-like cells can only become sperm if injected into a fetal testis. If injected into adult testes, then they just die. And as I said, if you make a mistake and inject uh, P IPS cells that haven't differentiated into PGC-like cells, then you'll get a tumor and the animal dies. Alternatively, they can become oocytes only if injected into fetal ovaries. Now, I know a question you're going to ask. Uh, it's been tried. Can you, uh, say, in, uh, inject an IPS cell developed from a male uh, into a female ovary and, uh, and develop anything? And, and no, it doesn't work. It has to be XX into an ovary and XY into a test is. Now, these sperm and eggs in the mouse IVF make normal offspring, and they grow up to, be, uh, to have normal offspring just with natural intercourse. So if the PGC cells are directed into adult testes or ovaries, rather than fetal or neonatal, they will just die. Now, we do have a hope, and we've got a project on this, that if you uh, have a little boy who never had his testes frozen before he uh, had his uh, cancer therapy, and so you don't really have SSCs to work with, uh, we could take his skin cells, because uh, there's no genetic defect otherwise uh, preventing spermatogenesis, and uh, we can certainly make PGCs easily. Question is, do we have to somehow or other uh, culture them in a uh, testes-like complex, or uh, if they're young enough, can we still get, because the male is different than the female, still get SSCs, semantic only stem cells, from PGCs directly injected into the reedy testes? And we're thinking about that, because it could be. 
So, uh, so what happens to normal PGCs in vivo in the fetus is exactly what we do in vitro. So again, this is just a little diagram to show the difference between in uh, vivo and in vitro derived oocytes. And the difference simply is that uh, it, in vivo, these oogonia are, are uh, arrested in the primordial follicle. And in vitro, the PGCs go directly after what we call IVD into the secondary follicle and they go on developing. And it sounds great, but it isn't great. What we really need is a holding mechanism like naturally occurs in the primordial follicle. Follicle. That's why Dr. LaRonda's uh, discoveries, uh, I think, are very, very important because just developing these eggs isn't good enough because they'll be gone in no time. And this is just uh, the diagram from the original uh, work with uh, Sato and uh, Hayashi. Uh, and uh, it's just what I've already told you, but it's sort of summarizing the genes that will convert IPS cells into epiblast-like cells and epiblast-like cells into PGC-like cells. Um, and this is just a, a, a diagram showing the same problem. The problem we have in the human, and we've begun the human study, is once we have these PGCs, how do we make germ cells? Uh, we, we, we're not going to be able to, I'm sure, get uh, fetal granulosa cells or fetal Sertoli cells from abortion clinics. It would be a disaster from every point of view, and we wouldn't be approved for that. So we have to find a way of getting, of making uh, from stem cells, uh, human uh, fetal uh, somatogonadal cells or human fetal granulosa cells. And we're working on discovering that now. And this is just another diagram. I, I'm full of diagrams here to, to give you the idea that uh, the long culture that we need uh, to make these oocytes is uh, mature is problematic. And what we'd rather do is take these oocytes as soon as we have them made and uh, freeze them just like normal and, and make primordial follicles. And this is just a diagram showing that it's a complete cycle, a complete circle. Uh, you have gonadal somatic cells go into, on the right-hand side, uh, go into the uh, PGCs, and it's almost automatic. They make primary oocytes, and you go around in a circle, and then you get M2 oocytes, and you fertilize them, and you get embryos. And then from those embryos, you, get, uh, you can get, uh, again, uh, stem cells and just continue this circle all the way. Uh, germ cells are really what makes the species and all of us immortal, and we can do the same thing with these uh, generated iPS cells. So here's the point, that last arrow. You still need embryonic cells, but we're not going to get them in humans, so what we need is to be able to develop the equivalent of uh, embryonic uh, granulosa cells and embryonic Sertoli cells. This is the automatic growth with uh, granulosa cells of an in vitro ovary. And we find that when there is uh, a, uh, a, a, when we finally get to the form of uh, the follicles, then we have to open up that follicle, and that's just a technical thing to make the FSH culture work. And this is just, uh, it's very difficult, tricky microsurgery. Hayashi and Ori have fantastic hands, uh, but this is one of the problems that, un until we can have a machine that does this, which I'm sure Pasquale will invent eventually, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, uh, it's very uh, technician dependent. But uh, so you do manual dissociation, and uh, you can see from that diagram below there, uh, it's best to uh, pick up that uh, oocyte uh, before it goes on a long stack, and a, a stock. And, and that's something Pasquale made a point of in his clinical IVF, that if you wait, if you, when you think you ought to give HCG maybe, it's not a good idea to, for a trigger to delay a day. And, say, and when, you, when you think maybe I'll wait a day, you probably shouldn't wait a day. And that was true in our in vitro work as well. Let me go, I don't have much time, so I'm going to run through these demonstrations quickly to get to the other points. So these are the first two mice that came from iPS cells. All the others who I just went through quickly came from embryonic stem cells, but these are the first two that came from actual skin cells. And oocytes in vitro do not pass through the primordial follicle stage, and that's because uh, they don't have FOX3 intranuclear. So how do we get FOX3 to go intranuclear? And how do we therefore make, in a sense, an artificial ovary? Well, again, it's, uh, we want to get the nuclei to rotate. When the nuclei are static, and I'm showing this again, then they develop. 
but if you get the nuclei to rotate, and that's a mechanical phenomenon, then you can freeze the primordial follicle. There are the rotating uh, nuclei in the primordial follicles, and as you go more towards the century, you see in the developing follicles, there's no, lo no rotation. So uh, what about uh, this paper by Isha Couric in 2016 was uh, uh, really interesting for the sperm side of it because we're making sperm as well as eggs, uh, and uh, Seto's lab is working more on the sperm and Hayashi more on the eggs. So again, they were able to reconstitute embryonic testicular somatic cells, just the somatic cells, put the PGCs in mice into that, uh, into that sort of artificial testes and differentiate them into, into SSCs or spermatogonia stem cells. And then those spermatogonial stem cells, but not PGCs, colonize adult testes and contribute to spermatogenesis and fertile offspring. What uh, Kyle and I are hoping is that if we have a young enough adult, like these uh, young cancer patients, that we might get nonetheless some PGCs to develop into SSCs, even though technically speaking it's an adult. So mouse pluripotent cells are induced uh, into epiblast-like cells, which are induced into primordial germ cells with the capacity for both spermatogenesis and oogenesis. And male, male PGCs make spermatogenesis transplanted into the testes of neonatal mice uh, lacking endogenous spermatogenesis. And that was originally Hayashi's paper from 2011. And um, I think I have to skip. Uh, this is all what I've said already, and I want to skip this to uh, get to the human point. So, um, spermatogonial stem cells can colonize the adult testes, and we've known that for a while, but how do we get PGCs to colonize the testes? So here's a video I want to show you of uh, how we do this in the human. We've been practicing this because we're ready to do it very soon. So under ultrasound guidance, the reedy testes of uh, humans and apes is different from what you see in the textbooks. It's not a little collecting area near the head of the epididymis. It's a long, sort of like linear string of, uh, of an alley, more or less. And keep watching, and you'll see when we inject uh, a sonolucent material, a sonoopaque material, you're going to begin to see the seminiferous tubules light up. And this is how we're going to colonize the testes with SSCs and maybe with PGCs. So it's not an easy technique. I have to tell you, it requires a huge amount of practice. So we don't want to do it in real, though we have patients ready for it and we have their frozen material. We don't want to do it until every time we practice this, we have 100% success because you'll be wasting the material if you inject it outside of the reedy testes. And it's very tricky to do. So what about in the human? That was a prelude to what we're going to do in the human. And uh, I think I only have uh, maybe four more minutes. So what we're doing now with Amanda Clark is we are uh, taking uh, skin biopsies from every woman with POF and even for women that are menopausal that don't have POF. And we're inducing pluripotent stem cells and making absolutely sure that they're perfect in every respect because many of these stem cells you make won't fit all the criteria. So we want to develop lines of perfect pluripotent stem cells. We'll also do the same for azospermic men. And we're going to be differentiating between men who have an obvious genetic cause of azospermia. And uh, we're probably happier with, uh, with uh, men who had uh, uh, cancer as a kid and who uh, or earlier in life and who don't have a genetic uh, cause for the azospermia. And we're just going to make a large number of these and then turn them into PGCs. Now, these uh, human uh, iPS cells are created by treating skin or other human cells in the laboratory with genes or other agents so to reprogram and make iPS cells. So these iPS cells can grow forever in appropriate laboratory conditions, and this motivates a lot of patients to uh, contribute to this study. And they have the ability to become any tissue in the body, as we know, but what we're interested in is eggs or sperm. So we've generated three human-induced pluripotent stem cells lines already from the dermal fibroblast of a 55-year-old woman who was once fertile. And these stem cells are young. And so if we generate eggs from these stem cells, it'll be like a young woman or a girl even.
The skin biopsy is broadly consented for generating these iPS cells for any biomedical research. So the patients know that they can be used for a lot of other things. And for example, we, we've talked about longevity for a second with David Keefe and telomeres. But think about this rotation phenomenon. We're discovering in bioengineering that these rotation phenomenon occur in many other tissues in the body. And they control and arrest uh, processes that are going to use up energy and possibly create mutations. And so um, it's possible that we could be talking about longevity in general if we study better the rotation of nuclei and how we get them to rotate by increasing the pressure in the incubator. So these are just an example of some of those cell lines. Uh, and we verified these are perfect cell lines. Uh, and there's no residual Sendai virus in them. There's totally uh, self renewal markers of OCT4, NANOG, uh, TRA181, and SSEA4. And we further uh, verified uh, pluripotency by making teratomas. And these sublines are controls for all of our research projects. And what allowed us to originally get the IRB for this was was that we have identical twins, as you know, women. They're discordant for ovarian, premature ovarian failure. And we wanted to know uh, at what stage, uh, epi uh, what stage uh, um, that um, germ cell, uh, I'm sorry, but, but the germ cell identification occurs. Is it the same as in the mouse, in the early epiblast? And we have the obstetric history of all these twins. So therefore, by if we can make germ cells from their skin cells, then we know it's not a genetic cause of the discordancy, even though they're identical twins, but it's a matter of uh, uh, discordant uh, separation of uh, early germ, germ cells in the uh, epiblast. So that's how we got permission to do this. And uh, by every way of looking at it, by all these markers, these are really very, very good uh, uh, stem cells. And we now have over 20 subjects, and I'm anticipating it's growing so quickly very soon we'll have hundreds of these stem cell lines. So uh, from Amanda's lab, they also have done this uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, primate model, non-human primate, with primordial germ cell-like cells following transplantation into the adult gonadal niche. And I think now my time is just about up. So let me go through this. So what about, these are my last slides, towards human egg-like cells in vitro. And uh, this was a paper that uh, they're friends, they're also friendly competitors that Sato came up with. Uh, and this is where uh, these PGCs have actually been incubated in fetal granulosa cells of mice. So they have human PGCs, which we have, <laughs> And rather than looking necessarily for human uh, fetal granulosa cells, they are incubating them in mouse fetal granulosa cells. Now, they're not making good eggs, but they are making PGC sort of like cells that express some of the markers of PGCs. So it's not the way we're going to go in the future, but it, it tells us that it's going to be possible to mature these human PGCs uh, or PGC-like cells into oocytes. But of course, it's species-specific, and we're not going to be able to do it with the mouse. The step we have to use is to actually generate the transcripts that will make uh, fetal granulosa cells, fetal Sertoli cells from stem cells in a totally different line of development. And that's what we're working on now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for being on time. Now, we have a still, if you have any questions, we have a couple of minutes for questions if you need it. Chairman, a very quick question. Can you speculate at what stage of this IPS cell can produce the a primordial cell or whatever the cell we want to call them, but they have this uh, epigenetically ready nuclear equivalent to the germinal vesicle. Well, um, I'm sure, not sure I heard it well. My hearing isn't so great. But uh, let me see if I get this right what you're saying. Uh, the, the, the increased pressure uh, causes rotation of the nuclei, and that causes an arrest of these uh, in vitro generated uh, 
oocytes. And as far as epigenetics, uh, the, uh, this was proven by uh, Mitnori Setu uh, a few years ago, that these um, uh, in vitro generated uh, oocytes go through normal epigenetic processes. Yeah. So uh, do you think at the pro before the primordial follicle stage, the nuclear already equivalent to the normal geminal vesicle stage oocytes? I, I think we talked about that a yeah, little bit earlier, yeah, and I think yeah. it's a brilliant idea. You always come up with these brilliant out-of-the-box ideas, and I think we should do that. And I think it's great. <laughs> Thanks, Roman. That's uh, terrific. Uh, just a comment and a question. The comment is, you know, the, there's some very nice work uh, from Ted Salmon and uh, Paul Allen, some of the folks at Woods Hole that used um, uh, in vitro uh, models of microtubules and actually pressure um, uh, actually nucleates uh, and activates uh, my, the, the microtubules. So there may be actual, you know, a, a biochemical mechanism that's the pressure is mediating through microtubules, and there's some ways you could test whether it's microtubule. Like if you just take like cow brain and extract um, uh, you know microtubules, and then you change the pressure, they, zoop, zoop, they, they go back and forth depending on the pressure. So it's a real biophysical process. It'll be interesting to see if those same fundamental biophysical rules are generating that finding. The question is a little bit derivative to what John said about the epigenetics. Has anybody done um, bisulfate reduced sequencing just to see? Because that's kind of the, the magic, uh, you know. I mean, we, you know, we still hear in vitro fertilized babies have these altered, you know, uh, epigenomes and stuff. Uh, so then you can imagine trying to reconstitute that in vitro. Have, have you done any of that just to see how similar they look uh, if you do bisulfate, reduce sequencing to look at the uh, methylation pattern in, you know, in vivo versus in vitro. Is it close, not too close? Well, yeah, I, my, my hearing is terrible and it's through oh. an amplification. I may not get it all right, but I think I know what you're, I think I know what you're saying. We're all mystified about what is the mechanism for pressure causing FOX3 to go intranuclear yeah. and causing the rotation to occur? I mean, that's going to require a lot of research. Now, I, I neglected to mention, I, I should have, other collaborators um, that uh, it's uh, Ariella Shikhanoff at Michigan and one of my new colleagues, uh, Yuting Fan, are working on this very issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Lonnie Shea is working at it uh, with them as well at Michigan. They were all part of that Northwestern group. and. Uh, um, uh, it's a puzzle. It's about it's it, for the whole body. It's a it's a major, it's a major field in most bioengineering departments in the country now. Yeah, I'll send you the paper from Shinya in a way. It's like 1959, where he 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 literally showed using his uh, Shinya in a way is a sort of the father of light microscopy. Showed altering, just passed away. Yeah, um, that um, you know by altering. Atmospheric pressure, you you change. Uh, so I'll send you that. It's it just sort of got lost because I don't people didn't. It was a basic fundamental. It's biophysics, you know. So, but then what about the epigenome? What about the ep epigenetics of these oocytes? Are they close to in vivo? Or are they far? I'd like to. I really would like to see that because it is true. This isn't a very efficient process, and so yeah. we need to improve the efficiency by understanding yeah. the epigenetics better. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation.